When the Civil War broke out, many thought that it would only last for a few weeks. But it's now been a year since the military surrounded the rebels in the capital, cutting off all their supply lines. The civilians still trapped in the city suffer from hunger, disease, and the constant threat of shelling. It's another day of desperate waiting for the end of this terrible war. We play a lot of board games for fun, right? You got the laughs, the smiles, but what about something really serious? Like a reenactment of a city under siege in Bosnia 40 years ago, and you, you don't play as soldiers. You play as normal people caught in the crossfire. Can that be fun? Well, this is a terrifyingly realistic game. Let's enter the Hello War. In this co-op game, all you're trying to do is survive. You and your friends are gonna control a group of survivors who use this ruined house as a base to go through the different phases of each day. And this is all gonna be inside, of course, this wartime city. And these guys are real people, so they'll need food and water at the end of every single day. Yeah, there are smaller objectives in the game, but really, all you want to do is have at least one person live by the time the war ends. That's all you need to know about this game for now. So now on to the review, starting with the pros. And this game just immediately drops you into this dark, sinister atmosphere of being a victim of war with its shadowed dark board. And then there's also a nice section for all the decks of cards to organize the sheer amount of content in this game. When unboxing, you'll realize that the game tells you where to put each of its tons of pieces into its terrific insert. Oh man, and then the tokens also do a great job of immersing you. The water is translucent, and the wood and gray component pieces are actually 3D plastic. There's a beautiful distinction for the tons of items, like these broken items looking like they're literally broken. And the minis draw you even closer into this gloomy world with 12 detailed minis that will lead into the variety of roles you can control. It's really fascinating looking at these from a traditional gaming perspective because these are, well, normal people. Not spies, marines, or anything flashy, just plain old people. Some will have special abilities, which fleshes them out, but are still realistic. There's the firefighter, Marco, who can use a hatchet to just break down doors. You are going to see slightly goofy things occasionally in this game though as light comic relief, like there's a TV host on a cooking channel who can just snap his fingers and voila, some veggies can just come up. They're going to have quirks too, like certain people getting miserable without coffee or without cigarettes because of their dependency. When you're starting this game out, it does something interesting, which is probably inspired by this game being originally a video game. Now, basically, this War of Mine, the board game, doesn't have a normal learning process. It wants you to just delve right into the game without not knowing anything, and it'll teach you the game as you go along. This really hammers home the whole, well, you're thrust into a war zone, you don't really know what's going on, and you're going to have to learn how to cope with this new life you're living. So when actually playing this game, it'll suck you into its shattered world. It'll feel big resource stricken and unforgiving. Fortunately, the game isn't overwhelming though and can be broken down into two main parts that flow really well. You got a peaceful daytime and then you got a nighttime. For the daytime, you're gonna be huddled inside your house doing chores and labors, but you can go outside if you wanna run the chance of getting sniped. So yeah, you don't wanna do that all the time. And then when night falls, then you can go outside because it's a little safer and you can go scavenge. But safer doesn't really mean safe because you can run into people you don't want to. Let's go back to the day where the game has a very simple action flow. Just put your survivors on any space with the red circle in hand and they do it. Eventually, you're going to clear your house enough to walk around and build fittings inside that will let you do more and more things like building a trap to catch rats to eat, or a simple heater to ward off the cold. These are going to increase your action options, which feels great to see come about. 
But your survivors are ordinary humans, and they don't always have the stomach to constantly work. Basically, the worse someone feels, the less of these actions they can do during the day. Slightly tired, small effect. Very tired, big effect. They can only do one thing. There's a bunch of different stats to show the combinations of suck that can happen to these victims, which also means that there's a bunch of different ways your characters can get punished for a lack of resources. Plus, this is a convenient indicator to tell how your characters are doing at a glance. And then scavenging at night. This is where you have to leave your safe house to go outside to get some food because you have to eat tomorrow. And the big outside world is gonna have so much danger. There's only so much here that can be covered without spoiling the game. But what we can say is that this game does the randomness of war really well. You can choose which of the three changing locations from this deck you wanna scavenge at. And then when you go there, it's more likely to give you certain things. But more likely doesn't mean it's guaranteed at all. And sometimes you go home empty handed, but much worse can happen. Something that you'll have to be concerned about is the noise. This is like a ticking time bomb where the more you search, the more noise you might make. And if you fail it's harder and harder dice roll while searching, you've made too much noise. Someone has come to see who the hell is rummaging around. There's gonna be all sorts of personalities out there some that even don't want to fight you and are as scared as you. But then there are some that are jumping at the chance to fight you because they're starving and want your stuff. And if you do decide to fight these people, or have to, you just handle it with special dice. You just roll dice per person in the fight for what weapon they have, and each enemy has 3 health total. But fighting isn't just an interesting occurrence, it's rather so, so dangerous. If your characters take damage, that is literal wounds that will give them less actions and are really, really hard to heal. And for guns, yes, they are super strong, but they take scarce ammo to use. So be careful how you pick your fights. Oh, and if you kill an innocent person, your characters might get saddened by the experience. The fact that all of this discourages combat is so appropriate for this game because you are not a soldier. Another thing about this city is that your house which is shelter from the cold, is valuable. So someone always has to stand watch at night. When these night raids come daily, often the best case scenario is that starving people come and steal your stuff. These night raids do sometimes trigger combat though, so that's another thing to watch out for. This also ties into how you never feel safe enough playing the game. You may have weapons, but then you're debating about whether to give it to your scavengers or the person guarding your house. What's brilliant is that they didn't just stop the decision making with how you want to manage your character statuses, how you want to build your house, or how you want to scavenge, because there's also trading in this game. See, each and every single item is going to have a money value on it, and this is incredibly fitting. And now you can even trade obsolete things like jewelry for things you really need to survive. Trading isn't guaranteed either though, there's not the stable marketplaces there were before the war. You gotta hope that the right location cards come up, and then sometimes when you trade, they're gonna rip you off, and you have no choice but to pay up. To get the misery of this really cemented in your brain is this thing right here. The Book of Scripts. Now, this is an almost 2,000 writing prompt entry book that will constantly inject flavor text or even short dialogue trees into this game. Yeah. Sometimes you'll meet strangers, and you as a group will have to decide what to say, and then you flip to see what happens next, and you read it out loud. It's really like a choose your own adventure book. It's great. The stories are gonna range from the mundane to the really, really grotesque. Sometimes it'll even ask for your survivors' names themselves, and it'll flesh out their lives quite a bit. And these aren't goofy at all because they never feel out of place. This is because their numbers correspond to in-game cards. As an example, the locations each have a set of numbers, and then to find out which of the numbers you go to, just flip from this color deck, and just like that, you'll have an appropriate cutscene come up. So with this book of scripts, you may be saying, well, that seems fairly random. And well, yeah, it is. Never feels out of place though, but it has to be random because, need I remind you, you're living in the middle 
of a war zone, not commanding it, so terrible things will happen to you. But remember, there is still a ton of decision making in this game to crunch on. When we take a closer look at building things in your house, it's a really tricky decision with 15 cards to choose from, and then you can think of 15 new ideas to upgrade things or just build a chair to reduce misery. Thinking about how you want to spend your limited stuff here is going to be really tricky, and you always want to build at least one or two, or else your wood just sits there unused. Even seemingly simple stuff like eating or drinking will have some choices to make as you decide how to ration your different types of food, because everyone needs to eat each day. Plus, when scavenging, managing the risk is super tense, as at any time, you can decide to stop searching and just go home. But sometimes you just need one more good find, and you are so tempted to flip another card from the deck. But you have to ask yourself, are the risks of going deeper worth it if we make too much noise, meet some soldiers, and get shot to death? Again, it's war, and some stuff is going to be always bad and outside of your control, like a bad twist of fate, or a really brutal weather change. But it never feels zany, which keeps you engrossed in the story. The story you'll be weaving will also have some nice progression. You're building better actions, so then maybe now your characters don't have to sleep on the floor, but can sleep on a bed, or they can take a nap in the middle of the day. Every couple of rounds, a chapter objective will resolve, and then you gotta make sure you complete it in time or else you get punished. Also over time, your character's wounds and illnesses can get worse if untreated. How's that for some fitting, but brutal progression? Did I mention that this game is super hard? Awesome thing though, this game comes with a save system, so you can take your time mulling over the complex decisions. This is going to make completing your first playthrough much easier for those who just can't keep a game sitting out. All you have to do to save is write down on your notepad your current board state, put the cards removed from the game in one bag, and the cards you're using in the other. Granted, it's not going to be as fast as reloading a video game, but it definitely works. But hey, here's the thing about time length. It runs fairly true to that. This game does say it takes about 45 minutes to 2 hours, and after your first playthrough, this will be basically correct. This is because on your first playthrough, you'll be learning how to manage the piles of decks and making sure you soak in all the possibilities of how to build your house. Just keep in mind that games can definitely take longer than 2 hours, if you love to be very careful and talk through every single decision. But man, that's also what's so great about the sheer realism and weight of decisions in this game. Things really do feel like they matter, so feel free to take your time. Don't worry about starting a new game if you lose though. This isn't one of those games you play once or twice and then you see all that there is to see. This game has so much replayability from the bunch of different decks 12 characters with different stats, and even different chapter objectives that you'll see throughout many, many playthroughs. If you're hungry for more, there is a difficult side of the board if you really want to lower your odds of survival to below hell for some reason. It alters old actions, gives you some new actions, and even the house will look completely different. If that's not enough for some reason, there's not one, but two additional scenarios you can play out. These are each going to give different setup, flavor text, and a slight change in rules. We haven't played these though because the base game has so much content to offer. At a glance, in the one called The Last Day, you'll need all four characters to survive, and you'll have access to a bicycle while scavenging, which is going to change nighttime strategy for sure. Just in general, there's so much content here. There's the stacks and stacks of decks, and huge book of scripts that sometimes offers branching decision trees. And we haven't covered these guys yet, the narrative actions, and what these do is give you some more decision making on how to use their once per game abilities, like getting a headshot during combat. But it can also trigger all sorts of new encounters with the visitor deck, maybe someone will join your house. Even your house itself will change the sequence in which it grants you stuff as you clean it. The game even includes blank tokens and cards, because there's even more special tokens that just couldn't fit inside the box. For these, sometimes you'll be prompted to ride on them, and then they have very, very unique things going on. To wrap up, this war of mine is going to have this city wartime survival theme just meet the gameplay excellently. Because scarcity is the name of the game here, you're hopeful for the next day to come so the war can finally be over, 
But at the same time, you're so scared about what tomorrow will bring and if you're gonna, if you're gonna have any food at all. Many important items have weight too, so you might not wanna bring a heavy shotgun to scavenge all the time because it'll be taking up space that could have been water. You can eventually do simple crafting in your house, like making cigarettes or weapons, and then trade them if you want. But make sure not to work every hour of every day because your characters will keep getting tired as they're forced to do things at night, and then that's gonna exhaust them to do less things during the day. Survivors will have to sleep at some point, even if it's on the floor, and then they don't do anything for a bit. For these survivors like Anton the math professor, they're gonna come alive as real human beings you're guiding through this hellhole. The game can reveal more about their backstories of who they were as people before the war, like someone just missing their spouse and children because they haven't seen them for weeks and weeks. And it's never quite the feeling that you wanna get more survivors to win either because more people is more malice to feed. And more people in your house means that there's a higher chance of illness just spreading. But at the same time, doing anything at night on your own is risky, so look out for each other. If you do get lucky and find a lot of stuff without being attacked, well, a lone person can't carry all the food, water, and resources, so you're put in a tough position. And survivors care for other humans too. If someone dies, each survivor usually just gets a little bit more miserable, even if you killed strangers in self-defense while scavenging. Here's a story of misery in this game that still doesn't spoil much. Once during a playthrough, we were knocked down to two characters. We had Marco the firefighter and Sveta the school headmistress. Now we had to send out Marco to go scavenge because we really needed water. But we also wanted to trade our cigarettes away because they were in really high demand. But also, we made two of them by hand. So we wanted to get some profit off of that. Well, the thing is, is that Marco was scavenging before he decided to trade. And while scavenging, he met some soldiers and he felt like trying to reason with them, to talk to them. And they weren't having it and they shot him three times. Twice while they were fighting, once while Marco was trying to run away. So Marco died and then Sveta was left. And Sveta was on the edge of complete depression. So to drink away her sorrows, she traded all of the colony's weapons, which is just her now, all of these weapons for a bottle of moonshine to survive just one more day. She died the next day. This war of mine, the board game. Now we get to the cons of this war of mine. And something that immediately jumps out is the player count. Now this game says it's for one to six players. Now you probably don't want to play this dark, somber game with a lot of people, especially because there's nothing that changes about the game when you add more people. You're all still controlling all their survivors and there's no hidden goals or objectives for individual players to promote drama. Cross out the five to six players and maybe even four is pushing it too. This game really does shine in small, close-knit groups. The more you know the people you're playing with, the better because this game is so intensely serious. That's it for the cons, let's get into the nitpicks. So this game has a bit of an extreme anti-gaming rule. It says that you're supposed to pass around this journal very frequently whenever you see this next player icon come up and then you pass the journal. And the thing is, whoever's holding this is the only one that can touch the components. Yeah, only the person touching this can touch the game. That means that everyone else, when they're not touching this, just has to take their hands and twiddle their thumbs or just, I don't know, sit on their hands so they don't accidentally touch the game. Most groups should ignore this rule. It's inefficient and frequently promotes disengagement. Instead, we suggest having your group divvy up the roles to certain people. For example, in the day, you can have one person be the buildable card manager, while another person keeps track of the survivor's well-being and special abilities. For nighttime, one person can read the book of scripts, then one person flips over the exploration deck. You'll certainly find something that works for you, and there's definitely no shortage of things to manage if you're playing with a small group. 
Let's get back to this journal that you'll be passing around. While it's definitely engaging to be holding a cool looking journal when it's your turn, it's passing is too frequent once you get the hang of the game, where sometimes you pass it like every minute or so. This is especially more annoying during the scavenging phase, where sometimes you'll flip over a card, not much will happen, and the game just tells you to pass on the journal. You'll have to experiment with journal passing to see what works for your group, because whoever does hold it does have the final say in decisions. For the last nitpick, this game is going to be a slow, slow burn to learn if you decide to go in blind like how it's intended to be learned. Remember how this journal teaches you through the phases of each day as you're first starting out? Well, this is a neat idea, but because the game is so dense, this guarantees lots of reading for each player before you make any first decisions. It does the job and teaches everything in a chronological manner, but because you're learning the game in a chronological manner, you're not going to understand the weight of any of your decisions for a while. Plus, if someone has a question, well, the current player marker they're holding literally is the rulebook, so then you have to grab it from their hands, which disrupts things. So for your first playthrough, we suggest at least first reading the journal beforehand if you want to do the game suggested journal learning with your friends. Oh yeah, and then we gotta talk about the fact too. This game has one. It's hidden inside here, but it's actually hidden. Like there's no dedicated area for it. So that means you gotta search through the rule book, find these numbers, and then look them up in this. This means there's no quick way to quickly search up something, which is annoying because this game has so many interactions, and plus, the rule book is pretty unorthodox. To relieve these nitpicks, the game should have included a separate booklet for the fact and then at least a current player marker, so you wouldn't have to deal with the rule book being the current player marker at the same time. Ah, and then what about the building cards for newcomers? The game is really showing its video game roots here, where a screen could lay out 15 things available to build, but in the board game, these are annoyingly double-sided with different costs and abilities. If there could be a single sheet that showed all of these, it would make building them way less daunting for newcomers. So now we get to the recommender score, where we try to critically evaluate the game given the aforementioned pros and cons. And this war of mine, the board game, is going to get a 9 out of 10. It's excellent. This game is going to be a real change of pace for many gamers, even co-op gamers. It's an original implementation of a popular setting, war. And then all of its actions and die rolls are going to reinforce that wartime scarcity and tension so well. You really need to know what you're getting into with this game. It's, it's hard. It's really hard. Don't expect to win on your first playthrough. It constantly, constantly makes it clear that you are victims of this terrible war. It's so bleak and miserable that sometimes you may find it hard to want to go for another round, another day in this war because it's that immersive. It's not satisfying in the way most games are. It discourages adventure, your characters tend to decline over time, and the scarcity is so extreme it's downright brutal. You're going to want to give this game a lot of your time. It's meant to be approached slowly, methodically, so then you can let all of these wartime elements just wash over you. Even when you're struggling to learn the game, you'll feel like a lost, shell-shocked survivor. When the game is beating you to a pulp, and you feel like you have almost no hope left? Well, the days keep coming. The game continues on. It's so real, and the story usually only ends once you're all gone. If you're concerned about realism, on Board Game Geek, a survivor of the siege itself stated in his glowing review that if someone asked him how it was like living under the siege, he would sit them down and play a round or two with them. He said that it felt like the designers were there in real life, taking notes on everything going on. So this all begs the tricky question, well, this game is clearly amazing, but am I going to have fun playing this game? Well, there's no pinpoint planning you can do to prevent the war from just wrecking your livelihood, but there's no shortage of decisions to mull over. Survivor junkies are really going to like the diversity of resources here. Sometimes you will just get mercilessly beat around though, but it only feels unfair in the context that Actual people had to go through this. And these actual people will feel so alive in your hands 
and this game almost feels like an awesome character study of how certain people do in these crises. Is it worth saving some versatile wood for a guitar so then the aspiring musician can strum a tune and cheer the others? What does a deserter do when he goes back to civilian life, armed with his combat prowess but still as emotionally weak as ever? This game constantly pours out tough questions, and you can find yourself dealing with your own shadowy side of human nature. Can we survive without stealing or killing innocent people? You and your group will have to debate all these decisions, and you're going to have to face the consequences. Some of them might haunt you. It's clear that this was ported from a video game with the stacks and stacks of cards, and if you want to go faster, you may want to just play this game digitally. But if you want a bleak story around a table, this has the content and complexity to repeatedly put you into an unfortunate slice of history with its gripping storytelling. You don't want the real thing, and so this game is super close to that, while still being in a safe space with your small group of friends. You don't need to win in this game because experiencing this war of mine is a great story in of itself, whether you live or not. Go out and at least try this game if bleak, Dense wartime survival is a calling card for you. You can find this game depressing, but you can also find it hopeful as people actually had the willpower to survive such difficult circumstances. Man, for a game to truly reflect this, this really does go above and beyond what many are used to in board gaming. And who knows, maybe after playing this war of mine, you'll have a different viewpoint on what gaming means to you as entertainment. My personal score for this war of mine is a 7 out of 10. I have a good time with it. So I've always been a bit of a history junkie, and the fact that this was based off of real events really got me excited. But man, I was solely unprepared for the amount of complexity and nuance this game has. Like, man, when I first started playing, I thought it was too many components. So I began solo, and I felt beat up turn after turn as my characters succumbed to all their conditions. It's like this game does such a good job of putting you into this war that you don't want to keep going. I certainly got a bit of a zombie survival vibe with burning books and making your own alcohol, but in an all too real setting. But when I played this with my gamer friend where we could equally share responsibility on everything, that's when I really started to appreciate this game. He could take care of the tons of fitting cards, and then we could share the burden of managing the tons of components. Most importantly, since we were talking about all the survivors in detail while making decisions, it did feel like they came alive like never before playing solo. Plus, having someone to share the misery with in this game really helps give you motivation to keep going when things seem hopeless. So if I want to share a tragic, tragic story with one close buddy, this is the game for me to pull out. 99.999% of the time though, this game is not going to see play because of its limiting player count, heavy theme, and complexity. But this game does such a good job at guaranteeing historic misery that I can't deny that I'm blown away by the design. Like, survivors will get saddened when their fellow survivors are hurt, or they'll get even more sad themselves when they're sick. This game just feels very human. Do I find this game satisfying? Most of the time, no. I mean, sometimes it is pretty cool to roll your own cigarettes and then sell them. And then look at that, now you have a shotgun. That's always pretty cool. So while I do find the alternate scenarios and fitting possibilities exciting, I always have to take a step back and, and slow down because this game is going to have its painful moments to carry out its theme amazingly. In all, it is very memorable and a fresh change of pace for me. I don't quite tear up the same way here like I would after watching a well-crafted sad movie, but still talking through the moral implications of things is very fascinating. Very glad I played this game. I'll definitely be back for more. I suspect my score can only go up from here, especially as I get older. There's still so much of the game that I haven't seen after dumping tons of hours in, and the fittings are starting to make more sense and be less overwhelming. As always, thanks to our patrons for making videos like this possible. We got John S, Manuel G, Brian C, Clifford H, Aaron W, Max B, Bora, Jeremy M, C, Charlie P, Quinton S, Sam S, Travis R, Alvin Y, Von C K, Ryan D, Jennifer L, Quackle, Brett M, Matt G, Peter Z, Spinner71, 
Ryan J, Brad G, Arcade, and period. And then we got two Mad Lads of Cardboard. We got ZL and Jeff L and one Mad Lady of Cardboard, Amy. Thank you guys so much once again. Our description for a Patreon is down below. If you want to get your hands on this dark, excellent game, we got a link in the description below if you want to check it out. And uh, yeah, just let me know what type of co-op games you'd like us to cover next. I know Spirit Island was on the list, but anything else, let us know. And let me know if this War of Mine would be a game you want to try out, because yeah, it's definitely a different game. Anyways, I'll see you guys next time. Remember to sub and like the video. Later.